Welcome back to the stable. Nice to see you all. And I'm delighted to introduce today's author, Anne McCutcheon, who is the author of six books, most recently, The Life She Wished to Live, a biography of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. Uh, it was released in 2021 by W.W. W. Norton. And, uh, but writing books is not the only thing Anne does. She's also a very busy lyricist and librettist with eight commissioned works including The Dreamer, an opera that premiered online in 2021, right in the midst of COVID. Her latest book, The Life She Wished to Live, paints a vivid portrait of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings and the Florida landscape and people that inspired her. Rawlings was a tough, passionate, and independent woman who refused the early 20th century conventions of her upbringing. Determined to forge a literary career beyond those limitations, she found her voice in the remote, hard scrabble life of Cross Creek, Florida. And between hunting alligator and managing an orange grove, Rawlings employed her sensitive eye, sharp ear for dialogue, and philosophical spirit to bring life to an unknown corner of America in rich and tender detail. It was a feat that earned her the Pulitzer Prize in 1938. Sarah Harrison Smith, who reviews Books for the Wall Street Journal describes McCutcheon's book as, quote, fascinating and lively, a masterly and entertaining biography. So I want you to give a very, very warm welcome to Anne McCutcheon because she's been on the plane from Wyoming for, what, 18 hours? And only just I warned everyone, you just can't fly from Laramie, Wyoming uh, to this part of the country without um, at least three flights, but I didn't know it would take you know, two days. Uh, there were uh, missed, well, and I'm not going to tell you this story. I just got here. <laughs> but uh, I'm so happy to be here and, and thrilled to be able to talk about Marjorie and, and this book. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, on the staff of the Mount, Patricia Pin, who's been back and forth with me, arranging, uh, uh, you talking about that? <laughs> arranging my, my schedule and, and uh, <clears throat> sending me thumbs up every time uh, I, my flight made, you know, <laughs> especially the one that got me here 20 minutes ago. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so, I'll write about that someday, but. Not now. Um, how's that? Welcome, anyway. Thank you. So glad to be here. I have a, a few photographs will will um, be displayed as I speak. Not many. We'll just change them every every so often. But um, the, most of these photographs are not part of the um, photographs in the book. So they're they're ones that I wish I could have used but couldn't. I only choose so many, so I hope they, yeah. they help um, with what will be a talk. Um, so it's been interesting that I have something to do with music. I started life as a classical musician, uh, a clarinetist, and, and so I still um, tend to think of things in movements. Um, uh, and, and so this talk is in four movements. The title is How I Got the Story. Um, there are four movements, the origin story, the getting the story, notes on a legacy, and reflections on writing Marjorie. So here's the origin story, and the first slide can um, show us Marjorie at the gate. There. Oh, wow. There's Marjorie. So here's the origin story of this book. It was September 25th, 2013, 6.05 p.m. I was sitting in the sunroom of my house in Denton, Texas, reading and marking a college student's essay when this email came in from Joanne Bartlett, a friend in nearby Dallas. I came up with a harebrained idea, Joanne wrote. There's no real biography of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. A couple of books about relationships, letters, for example. But after rereading her Florida cookbook, I thought that might be a project to interest you. So give me a shout next week. After a quick Google, I replied, Joanne, you're right. I checked, 
And I'm shocked there's no true biography of MKR, as, as I abbreviated it. Absolutely, it would interest me. It could easily be my next project. So easily. I'll give you a shout next week. Much to talk about. Thank you so much. I continued marking student essays, but couldn't stop thinking about Joanne's idea. Some notions arrive out of the blue, and you know, you know, you must act on them, wild or impractical as they may be. You must act immediately. I put the essays aside, and I emailed special collections at the University of Florida, which I had discovered right then held Marjorie Kinnan Rollins' papers. I sent another note to Joanne. I wrote the archivist that if the coast is clear, meaning no one else is working on a biography, I'll dive in. I'll let you know what I hear. Two days later, I spoke on the phone with Florence Turcott, the chief archivist for the Rollins collection. Then I wrote to Joanne again. Joanne. Flo Turcott says, go for it. It's a project just waiting to happen. Come on down, she said. I encourage you to do this. I added, now, here are some things I have to attend to. First, I've had this notion to leave my job next May, live on less, become a full-time writer again. One goes back and forth in these things. <laughs> Leaving the job means more, yeah, keep your job, right? Don't quit your job. Leaving the job means more time to write, no dragging out a book summer after summer, as one does in academia. But it also means no university travel, research grants for such a project. So I'll check out what's available through the NEH and so forth. And Joanne replied, wowza. <laughs> Texas, wowza. Let me see what I can put together for you via the foundation. I would really, really like to see you pursue this and help with a project where I can. This is all inspired by talking with you about Florida and rereading Marjorie's cookbook. <laughs> I had met Joanne three years before when she and her husband, Dick Bartlett, hosted me at a retreat in the Davis Mountains, it's the Texas part of the Southern Rockies. The Bartlett's citizen conservationists retired from successful careers with Mary Kay Cosmetics in Dallas, had established a private foundation to support writers and thinkers working on projects related to environmental issues. They, with the help of a selection committee, invited one writer, thinker, sometimes they're the same thing, um, at a time, <laughs> to live in a small house they had built in the mountains adjacent to Dick's large environmental library. I'd been awarded a two-month residency to finish River Music, a book about Louisiana's Atchafalaya River Basin. The first night I was there, Joanne and Dick invited me to dinner at their vacation cottage down the hill. Over martinis, we discovered that Dick, some 15 years ahead of me, had grown up in the same part of Florida where I had lived in my teens, on the Atlantic coast not far from Cape Kennedy. He had attended the University of Florida. I had gone to Florida State. We talked about, yeah, rivalry there. <laughs> we, we talked about Florida all evening, the beaches, the swamps, even the tacky old tourist attractions. We really laughed at those, the roadside alligator farms, the fake Seminole villages, the fountain of youth, which is just a trickle in St. Augustine. <laughs> I'm sure it's there anymore. Um, Dick was Los Angeles born, tall, distinguished man. Um, he could not stop howling. Joanne, the eldest of seven from a Catholic family in Tulsa, now a long lapsed Catholic with a salty tongue, kept the drinks coming. When I returned to the library that night, I could not sit still, but roamed about checking out the titles and discovered six shelves of books about Florida. Proof of Dick's passion for what both of us, Yankee transplants, considered our home state. Suddenly, I knew what my next book would be, even though another was still in progress. I sat down right then and began a memoir of growing up in Florida, and I worked until the sun rose over the eastern mountains. That was June 2010. In May 2011, Dick Bartlett succumbed to cancer. I'd known he was ill, but not how ill. 
Joanne discontinued the Fort Davis residencies. They were too much for her to manage alone, and there were other projects she would take care of, such as annual awards and scholarships to environmental science teachers and students. Remembering the Florida connection, she asked me, along with an editor at Texas A&M University Press, to come out to Fort Davis one weekend and help her pack up Dick's library. It was all to be donated to Sulras State University. As we pulled so many books from the shelves, Joanne asked if I'd like to have Dick's Florida books, which included every book Marjorie Kinnett Rawlings wrote. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would like them. And so we boxed everything Florida for me to take home. Because I lived close to Dallas, Joanne would occasionally invite me down to lunch or dinner. When River Music was published in 2011, she hosted a celebratory luncheon in the Zodiac Room of Neiman Marcus, my first and only visit to that fabled department store. <laughs> a place which seemed, honestly, out of character for Joanne, who liked to boast about the deals she scored at Ross Dress for Less. <laughs> when Texas A&M encouraged my proposal for the Florida memoir, we celebrated that too. And then came the evening of September 25th, 2013, and Joanne's idea for a Rawlings biography. As I said, I wondered how I'd pull it off while teaching. But in the weeks that followed, Joanne noted that Marjorie Kenan Rawlings was a good match for the Bartlett Foundation's mission. Marjorie had been, in addition to a Pulitzer Prize winning author, a leading advocate for preserving Florida's natural environment. The foundation would match my salary for a year, so I could work on the biography full time. I took a leave of absence from my job. One year of support led to two, including research, travel expenses, and fees for research assistants in three cities. I resigned from the University of North Texas. <laughs> Joanne was, for a golden time, my co-conspirator. Every time I dug up some fascinating fact about Rawlings, or, or dirt, as we called it, I phoned or emailed her to share it. Once, when I needed to visit Rawlings' childhood home outside Washington, D.C., Joanne engineered a family trip. She, her son, Mike, his wife Kim, and I flew up together from Dallas. During the days, I did my research, and they went sightseeing. In the evenings, I reported my findings at dinner, and one night we were even joined by Rawlings archivist Flo Turcott, who happened to be attending a conference in the city then. But in December 2015, a month after Joanne had wired me flowers celebrating my contract with W.W. W. Norton, I received an email from Joanne's eldest son, Steve. Joanne had gone to the hospital two weeks before and died there. I did not know what took her, but I suspected lung cancer. She had been a pretty heavy smoker. I'm sorry to give you this news in an email, Steve wrote. However, at the end, my father, my mother, asked me to continue supporting you and the book. And so he and the foundation did just that through September 2018. Those four years of full-time support made it possible for me to research and write full-time and send a good, satisfying manuscript to my publisher in April 2019. The book's original dedication was to the memory of Richard C. Bartlett. But after Joanne's death, I amended it to include her. I tell you all this because the book that brought me here would not exist without Joanne, the philanthropist, literary matchmaker, and friend who suggested and backed the perfect project for a writer whose abilities she believed in. This particular sort of sustenance more often comes to composers or through private organizational commissions for an opera, let's say, or to visual artists who might attract an enthusiastic collector. But writers, no, we are less visible the work we produce makes no sound, can't be hung on a wall. Physical book appears more than a year after we completed it. And so, the kind of support that enabled me to write the life she wished to live is extremely rare, and I am so grateful. This will always be 
the number one part of how I got the story. There would be no story without Joanne Krieger Bartlett. Next. the first draft page of the yearling, or most of it. <clears throat> That's her, her typing her hand or cross outs. <laughs> so part two, notes on getting the story. I first heard about Marjorie Cannon Rawlings from my fourth grade teacher at McNabb Elementary School in Pompano Beach, Florida. It was early spring and Mrs. Chapman, a Florida native, decided it was a good time to share Rawlings' best known novel, The Yearling, with 29 year olds. Every day after lunch, for weeks, she read aloud a few pages, inviting the class to listen for the author's beautiful sentences and the backwoods Florida world they brought to life. All of us northern transplants, whose families had been lured to the state by the post-war boom, were entranced by this story, delivered during that delicious drowsiness following milk and sandwiches by an old-timer whose voice was as soft and suggestive as distant radio waves. The Yearling was our first impression of old Florida, the people's speech and traditions, and Mrs. Chapman's reading seemed a, a private thing, a gift from her to us. We didn't know that the book, a coming-of-age story about a boy, his pet deer, and his parents who farmed the North Central Florida scrub, had been the best-selling novel of 1938. Nor did we know the book had won the Pulitzer Prize and been translated into 29 language, languages, or that Metro Golden Mayor had made a popular film of it, starring Gregory Peck and Jane Wyman. All of this before we were born. By the time Mrs. Chapman read it to us, The Yearling had come to be thought of as a children's book because it centered on a young boy. It was a staple of the elementary school story hour. I loved The Yearling as one loves a fairy tale or a dream. And Mrs. Chapman's reading became one of my fondest memories. Much later, I read the novel by myself, silently admiring it as magnificent storytelling, as literature. The novel's lyricism, its fine rendering of country life, its use of local dialect, its structure, and emotional range revealed Rawlings the artist. And I wanted to know how she, born in 1896, had become one. For clues, I took up her 1942 memoir, Cross Creek, also a bestseller in its day, and reveled in stories of the tiny Florida settlement, where after 10 years of freelance work in New York, Louisville, and Rochester, she farmed oranges and established her writing career. Cross Creek was the place out of which she wrote no doubt, a magical spot. And finally, I traveled to the area, which had changed very little since she'd lived there. The hamlet was still a rural community on a stream between two lakes, Orange and Loch Lusa lakes, altered only by the soft conversion of Marjorie Rawlings' farmhouse, outbuildings, and orange grove into a state park with a paved road and guided walking tours. This photo was after Marjorie, but before the state park um, did it, you know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it was easy to imagine writing here, I think 1950s. Um, still, I wondered, who was the artist whose life and work had made a, a shrine of this outpost? Where, beyond her two best-known books and Floridian's sentimental tributes to her memory, and there are many, <laughs> was evidence of the complex woman Rawlings must have been. So in 2014, as I've said, and the support of Joanne Bartlett. It seemed the only answer would be to pursue a biography of Rawlings, just the one existed. It was more than 25 years old and possibly self-published, and no proof of scholarship. That's important. <laughs> when I contacted Flo Turcott at the Marjorie Kennan Rawlings Papers archive at University of Florida, I asked her if there'd be enough material to work with, and she said, no problem. It's one-stop shopping here. <laughs> I quickly learned that the Rawlings Archive is many stops shopping because the collection, including letters, manuscripts, news clippings, photographs, everything else, it's vast, which I found both reassuring, one wants material to work with, and intimidating, um, because you know, there's so much to go through. 
Even so, I suspected there were more resources to be discovered, and in time, that suspicion proved correct. While I relied on every possible source to create Marjorie's portrait, two large bodies of work were critical, and I'll explain what they, what they were. Um, first, more than 4,000 letters to and from Marjorie and her many friends, lovers, family members, professional associates, offer an extraordinary look into the writer's public, private, and interior lives. Her writings contain descriptions of experiences in the towns and cities she lived in or traveled to, her reactions to books, articles, political developments, encounters with other writers, reports on her uneven health, armchair analyses of pals, acquaintances, and employees. Letter writing in her lifetime, as you may know, was a standard form of extended long-distance communication. Depending on where one lived, telephone use was to various degrees um, limited and expensive. And at Cross Creek, even when phones were finally available, the service was spotty and was complicated by party lines, all kind of people listening in. <laughs> What's going on? Just pick up the phone. Um, Marjorie wrote many letters longhand, and her hand was long. Um, we passed it, but anyway. It was a bold, backhanded scrawl, broken by extended dashes. Possibly, she scribbled her boldest communiques while drinking, a problem illuminated by her correspondence. Other letters were carefully composed and typed. Some read like set pieces, worthy of a literary memoirist or a raconteuse, both of which she was. And occasionally, I found some of these pieces or anecdotes appeared nearly word for word in letters to more than one person. She was practicing. <laughs> But whether set down by hand or type, Marjorie's letters are full-voiced, often performative, sometimes irreverent. Her second husband, Norton Baskin, once said of her, she was really three people, at least, and you never know which one it was going to be. <laughs> one was as prim as a New England school teacher. She was just that, straight-laced and prim. And then again, she was an absolute bod, like a French girl. And last but not least, she was the hardworking, struggling writer and artist. In composing Marjorie's life, I frequently treated her correspondence as a Mike Handel interview material for a documentary. That is, I listened for the most telling or significant lines, paragraphs, whole letters, to reveal various aspects of the author and the ways she expressed herself in conversation with others, as well as to establish facts. That's a, the conversation is important. Um, um, I might, for example, find letters, I did find letters from Ernest Hemingway uh, to her in her archive, but then I had to go to a Hemingway archive to see her side of the conversation. So that's, um, that's a, a part of the, the research and, and part of what, what makes sense, made sense to me, makes sense of those letters. Um, her correspondence included Scribner's editor, Maxwell Perkins, her husband's, Charles Rawlings, and Norton Baskin close friends like her publisher's daughter, Julia Scribner. In fact, a collection of those letters between Julia and Marjorie has just been issued by the University of Florida Press. It's that thick. <laughs> um, writers including Zora Neale Hurston, Ernest Hemingway, Sigurd Unset. With all of these people, all these friends, she shared her creative struggles. And without those letters, it would be impossible to tell how Marjorie got any writing done while running a productive orange grove and after the Pulitzer Prize, leading an increasingly public life. Um, someone asked me uh, if, if I could say what this book was about in, in just you know, a few words, and I said, it's a book about how Marjorie got any writing done. Uh, <laughs> so the second significant body of work uh, I had uh, to start with, Marjorie's two autobiographical manuscripts, they nearly bookend her Florida writing years. Um, we can go to image four. Uh, there she is, little Marjorie. Uh, the first autobiographical manuscript, Blood of My Blood, is an account of her childhood, youth, and young adulthood. It stops at her mother's death in 1923. She completed it after moving to Florida in 1928 and entered it unsuccessfully in a novel writing contest. However, Blood of My Blood is more memoir than fiction featuring her parents, brother, teachers, and others true to her life, all properly named, and focuses primarily on Marjorie's difficult relationship with her mother, Ida Canan, 
whose ghost she needed to confront. If, if, if you read the book, you'll find that Ida Kanan was like the ultimate stage mother. And uh, if you have talent, you have to, uh, it's helpful and then it's not. Um, anyhow, not speaking from experience. Um, though Marjorie excoriated her mother in the manuscript, barely redeeming her at the end, she admitted her own perfection imperfections as a spoiled, manipulative child, understanding that she too was a flawed character. She wrote in the first and third person, alternating intimacy and distance, and dramatized scenes like the Hearst feature writer she had been, detailing physical surroundings with an observant journalist eye. That journalism work on the early side of her career was important. Settings were geographically and historically grounded, individuals convincingly rendered. Peeling away the passion and the need of this memoir, one can discern facts useful to a biographer. So I incorporated such information as confirmed by research. But a wonderful, um, I mean, not an assistant, an, an expert on her um, Brooklyn neighborhood in Washington, D.C., her early um, years, uh, Bob Maletsky, former NPR reporter, who knows, knows everything about that neighborhood. And boy, I can, can't say too many good things about him. Second autobiographical manuscript, Cross Creek is as much a classic as The Yearling, I think. It's a creative nonfiction chronicle of Marjorie's life at the creek, a succession of graceful, sometimes humorous narratives describing encounters with friends, neighbors, farmhands, wildlife, flora, fauna, weather. It's a treasury of true people, places, and events, meticulously, imaginatively, and, and urgently drawn. Besides Marjorie's letters and first-person manuscripts, various drafts of her work, from juvenilia to stories to the last of her four novels, offer a close look at her development as a writer, including themes and character types, such as the desire for home and the pre-adolescent boy, as we saw in The Yearling, persisted throughout her career. However, my biography, the biography was not included, sorry, not intended as a work of literary criticism. I very much um, concur with uh, the author Jeanette Winterson's warning against, quote, tying in the writer's life with the writer's work so that the work becomes a diary, small, private, explainable, and explained away, much as Freud tried to explain art away. I sought instead to illuminate Marjorie's humanity, her creative side, her creative mind and heart. To some extent, writers reflect who they read. Although Rawlings' personal library was scattered after her death, one can trace her voracious reading habits in her letters. She was interested in so much, literature, politics, history, science, philosophy, everything. She loved Proust. She detested Faulkner. She, <laughs> she read and reread the Bible, although she was not religious in any conventional sense. She often consulted William Bartram's 18th century travels, especially the naturalist observations of Florida. Also critical to understanding Rawlings are the times in which she lived. Although she aspired to write literary novels and short stories, she was an independent woman of limited means and directly after college in 1918, she needed to find a job, any job. Hoping to use her writing skills, she started out, started out as a YWCA publicist during World War II, or World War I, the end of World War I. This led to a spotty journalism career in the 1920s when women reporters were rare mostly freelance, and assigned lightweight features for the new women's pages, which multiplied after women gained the vote. In this, she was rewarded for facile storytelling, a natural ability her University of Wisconsin professor, William Ellery Leonard, warned her against, and with which she would struggle when she was writing serious fiction. It just came too easily. She had to back up and, you know, take a breath. In the years containing most of her uh, Florida output, which is 1930 through 1945, roughly, she was profoundly a serious writer of that era. During the Great Depression leading up to World War II, uh, a significant number of American authors chronicled isolated country, uh, corners of the country that hadn't been changed by modern life. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of these, um, these titles. Um, some felt an anthropological impulse, the field burgeoning in response to studies such as Margaret Mead's groundbreaking Coming of Age in Samoa, published in 1928. 
This urge teamed naturally with investigative reporting, a practice just a few decades old, which will lead to what is now referred to as immersion or participatory journalism. It's when the reporter fully involves herself in the situation, sometimes incognito. Other writers were moved by America's long-standing rural ideal, increasingly worshipped, feared for, or nostalgically mourned in the wake of the Industrial Revolution and the First World War. So it was no accident that in Marjorie, uh, Margaret Mead's Signal Year, 1928, when that book came out, the Library of Congress established the Archive of American Folk Song, sending folklorist John Lomax and his son Alan on expeditions to gather authentic folk songs before traditional tunes were wiped out by radio's new billboard hits. That was a new thing. Um, and you may remember that the WPA, Federal Writers Project, deployed hundreds of writers from coast to coast to document rural American life in that time. Um, there were Southern literary Renaissance uh, writers working, Thomas Wolfe, Look Homeward Angel, William Faulkner, The Sound and the Fury, again, Marjorie didn't like him much. They were among those who pulled away from romances about the antebellum South and responded to Southern culture after the Civil War. Among the Renaissance landmarks was Julia Peterkin's Pulitzer Prize for her 1928, that year, 1928 novel, Scarlet Sister Mary, which portrays black folk life in South Carolina's low country. Peterkin was the first Southern woman to win that prize. I know where I'm standing. I'm the, the first woman um, Pulitzer winner um, walked. Um, next. All right. There's Marge. <clears throat> With her first husband, husband uh, Charles Rawlings, um, this was taken uh, either, just after college or right at the time of time they married. We don't have just you know within a year, year and a half of that um, that time. But there they are, and um, and they were college sweethearts, and and her mother didn't approve, but she married him anyway, and um, her mother gave her a left and on birth control when it was just. You know, what? You should have said that a year ago, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> Marjorie had no children, but um, anyway, uh, the lecture came too late. Um, so, it so happened in 1928, the year of Peterkin's win, Mead's debut, the folk song, song archive founding, that Marjorie Rawlings decided to leave Rochester, New York, where she worked as a journalist, and, she, and her husband as well. He worked as a journalist as well. To try writing, she'd leave him later. Um, <clears throat> to try writing fiction in Cross Creek, Florida. With a small inheritance, she bought, sight unseen, a 72 acre orange grove and farmhouse, <laughs> determined, along with Chuck Rawlings, to write in deep country full time, living on citrus profits. As it turned out, the grove required far more labor than they imagined, a saga in itself. Yet, Marjorie also saw in Backwoods, Florida, a striking opportunity to immerse herself in a little-known culture and transform reporting into literary fiction. Within a few years of her arrival in North Central Florida, she had put the region and herself on the national literary map. Next picture, please. Here she is, interviewing a real Florida cracker, a neighbor. A neighbor. Over the course of her years at the creek, Marjorie made friends with a handful of cracker families scattered about the surrounding scrub and swamp and forest. Um, cracker means descendants of white, Scots, Irish, and English settlers. She stayed in local households, observing and experiencing hands-on her neighbor's way of living, taking notes on everything they did and what they said in their local dialect. She had an uncanny ear for speech and idioms. She was accepted in the tiny community, uh, albeit as an outsider and at times an eccentric. But like everyone else, she lent a hand, bartered, spun yarns. Next picture. All right, there she is in a house dress, catching crabs. She learned to catch crabs from a john boat at night. She hunted fowl with her shotgun, accompanied by dogs, a long line of dogs, and made moonshine in a swampland still. Um, next picture. 
There she is. With her daughter. I believe there's a kitty there too. She always had um, some, some of both. <laughs> Many of them. She enjoyed these activities, especially hunting with friends, local folk, and others from nearby Alcala and Gainesville, home of the University of Florida. From neighbor women and her various housekeepers, she learned to cook with ingredients she and her farm employees raised, poultry, fruits, vegetables, milk, cream, butter from Dora, her sainted dairy cow. She took pride in throwing dinner parties for friends passing through Florida, uh, from snowbird relatives to luminaries like Robert Frost and Wallace Stevens, and then she published a cookbook. Uh, one more picture. Uh, two after one. There she is with her duck. Everything Marjorie Rawlings experienced at Cross Creek contributed to her books and stories, and their successes in time expanded her circle, her life, well beyond that secluded spot. Although she stated more than once that she hated cities, she was also drawn to them, and left the creek often for metropolitan areas such as Atlanta, that was metropolitan for Cross Creek, um, now it really is, uh, Washington, D.C., and New York. Here she conducted the social business of her writing life, uh, savoring contact with writers, artists, and, and thinkers who were her peers. She attended concerts, plays, museum openings. She gave readings and lectures. She was a guest at the White House. She was a peripatetic, but she was full of contradictions. One might view Rawlings' work solely as a result of her socio-political time or a literary movement, but my deepest concern has been to discover and show how she created the life she wished to live as a writer with a poetic, philosophical impulse toward art making. And she had a strong urge to manifest that on her own terms. It's the strongest story running through the personal materials she left for us to consider. Since her college years as an aspiring poet and dramatist, she'd been obsessed with natural beauty and the notion of cosmic consciousness, the purview of Whitman and other poets she studied and with whom she felt kinship. At Cross Creek, she found the perfect, unspoiled environment out of which to attempt stories and novels reflecting the ideal. It's true that this section of Florida had yet to be significantly explored in imaginative literature, um, offering her a first-come opportunity. But just as importantly, its isolation harbored living examples of the radical interconnection between all living people and things a concept fundamental to cosmic consciousness. She loved it when an occasional critic caught on to that wider inspiration. Novelist John Gardner could have been describing Marjorie when he wrote, true artists, whatever smiling faces they may show you, are obsessive, driven people. <laughs> Often, her pleasant face dissolved in frustration, her mouth went to a thin line, and letters to close friends, and her editor, Maxwell Perkins, Marjorie repeatedly confirmed her drive, the struggle to balance the desire for solitary work and the demands of social needs, obligations, and outward events, as most writers do. I have an acute need for solitude, she scrawled one morning after her first husband and brother-in-law left the creek to run errands. Too constant contact with other personalities often weighs on me. I'm glad to be free for a day. She would have agreed with the poet William Stafford, who described his life as two rivers that blend. Quote, one part is easy to tell, the times, the places, events, people, he wrote. The other part is mysterious. It's my thoughts, the flow of my inner life, the reveries and impulses that never get known, perhaps even to me. The second part, he continued, has its own story, which sometimes touches the other one, but it's not the same. Okay, part three. Part three and four are shorter. <laughs> um, notes on a legacy. Marjorie's literary legacy alone made her worthy of close study and a full biography, but I found ever more to admire, to bring to light, especially for the times we live in now, not so far removed from 1953, when the great author died. Notably, she wrestled with her own racial prejudice following the sort of come to Jesus, as I always put it, experience of meeting and befriending Zora Neale Hurston, her literary equal. 
Much of her transformation is chronicled in correspondence with her second husband, Norton Baskin, who was serving in the American Field Service during the height of Marjorie's inner struggles. We can go to the next picture. What is it? Uh, we're having technical difficulties at the moment. Okay. Oh, there's some dogs. If you can get to the next one, I think it's Marjorie and her second husband. Um, the marriage to Charles Rawlings uh, sort of went bust after. There. Okay. I might as well tell you. Um, her marriage to uh, Chuck Rawlings um, went bust right after her first novel, Satin Under, uh, was published and, and widely acclaimed. Uh, there's some jealousy going on there. <laughs> Two writers. And, um, and uh, anyway, he, he left for actually Rochester. And um, uh, the marriage ended after uh, 12 years or something. She, some years later then, she married her good friend, Norton Baskin, who was um, a real um, uh, soulmate and just supported her. He was an outgoing hotel guy, but he always gave her her, her you know, space, her, her solid. They were a great team. Um, Anyhow, um, back to Zora. Um, intellectually, Marjorie saw her problem with racism, yet the seeds of so-called conventional white racism had been planted since childhood. At the creek, Marjorie had mostly adopted the racial attitudes common in that time and place. Her workers were second-class citizens, needful of management, discipline, even common sense. Mrs. Rawlings, kind as she was, never asked her workers to do anything. Her perfect maid, Idella Parker, remembered, she told them. She talked at them, not to them. At the same time, Marjorie was considered liberal by her white neighbors. She paid her black workers more than the going rate, provided more medical, legal, and personal support than was customary. She eventually became an outspoken advocate for civil rights in Florida. Uh, for example, she was a uh, principal speaker at a, uh, a, a big celebration honoring, honoring the distinguished educator activist, Mary McLeod Bethune. She was the only white person there, and she, she was the principal speaker. Um, we don't have the address. Boy, I'm trying to find it. But um, afterwards, she wrote to a friend, I am more than ever ashamed of the people who try to hold the Negroes back. And from there, um, she, she kept that stance, and she worked in her neighborhood, not just on this, in the stage, a national stage or a state stage, but within her, um, her village to, um, to, to move things along, which wasn't always easy. She was also concerned about the fate of Florida's natural environment. Um, Mid-1930s correspondence with a hunting companion suggests their shared despair over the Cross Florida Borge Canal project. I'm, I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, but um, the idea was to just cut a canal across the, the whole peninsula so you could go from east to west on um, the railroad. But um, that, that was in play for years and, and finally was, um, was thrown out. Um, so she became actually one of the three great Marjories that Florida, environmental Marjories that Florida claims. There's she, conservationist Marjorie Harris Carr, and um, Everglades advocate Marjorie Stone and Douglas. So we can talk about the three Marjories in, in Florida. Okay, part four. Here we go. Reflections on writing Marjorie. And perhaps this will um, bring up some questions. <clears throat> Marjorie, the last picture. Oh, wow. <laughs> when, when she um, finally made some money at writing, like with the yearling, <laughs> she was able to buy herself a beach house. Um, so many fans of the yearling just started coming down Cross Creek and barging in on her, you know, finding her place. And so she needed to find another outpost, and she bought this beach house on Crescent Beach, Florida, about 70 miles um, from Cross Creek. So this is a rather posed picture of her in uh, a gown, but it's a classic. <clears throat> so, last, my reflections on writing Marjorie. What's always interested me as a writer, which interests most writers in some way, uh, is contributing to the ages-old conversation about what makes us human. 
This is one of the motivations of the historian and by extension the biographer. Contributing to this conversation is a service we render. I, and that's the way I see it anyway, um, service. So how, I ask myself at the start of a project, can I be of assistance here? How can I illuminate? How can I, with all the skills I can summon, help expand our knowledge of ourselves and others? I believe that is part of what drove Marjorie to render in art the idea of cosmic consciousness, the notion that we and all living things are connected and we would do well to pay attention. That was her gospel. She wrote in passionate service to the complexity of the human condition. In turn, I approached Marjorie's life with no less than reverence. Here was a certain complex woman who accomplished certain marvelous things. She was not alive to speak for herself, nor for me to observe in the flesh. Most of what I had to work with was on paper. Paper. <laughs> At least there was plenty of it. But paper with writing on it is not a person. And my task, I adapted um, Proust's notion that lived experience embodied in material objects remains captive until we should happen on the object, recognize what lies within, and set it free. Reading Marjorie from shopping lists to published books required in me the openness to happen on things, to be simply curious, to observe closely, to discriminate, to recognize her, to see Marjorie as best I could. From these happenings, observations, sympathetic soundings, I would make judicious choices out of respect for another human being whose life I would interpret for others. A month after The Life She Wished to Live was published, my editor asked me about the next book, a biography of another Southern woman. Writer, perhaps? Huh. Well, I had a great editor. <laughs> um, she's still speaking to me. <laughs> but I wanted to say, <laughs> are you kidding? It's too soon to jump into a new project. I need a detachment period. I'm still living large with Marge. <laughs> so, it seems fitting then to close with an attachment detachment story. <laughs> Three years ago, uh, while visiting Denver, a friend and I happened to stop into a rare book emporium where I discovered a first edition of Marjorie's last novel, The Sojourner, so only $30. And I squealed with delight, I carried it to the counter, and the clerk asked me about my interest in the book. And I told her, and she said, ah, you'll be interested in this. And from a glass case, she drew a 1950 edition of The Yearling, with illustrations by M.C. Wyeth and signed by Marjorie. Aww. Aww. Autographed in that marvelous scrawl. Aww. How much was it? <laughs> I asked. $650. <laughs> oh, I can't afford that, I said. The clerk popped back into another room where I learned the store's owner was pricing books. The clerk returned. For you, we would only ask $525. <laughs> And as in a dream, I handed her my credit card <laughs> to be maxed out by Marjorie. As the clerk ran up the charge, I texted the archivist Florence Turcotte at the University of Florida um, with a photo of the book confessing my uncharacteristic splurge. Promise to leave it to the University of Florida, she replied in the deadpan New England accent. For four years had made me laugh. She's from Providence. Um, as my friend and I left the bookshop, I felt a twinge of a hunch, and I asked her what day it was. December 14th came my friend's answer. I nearly dropped that precious volume. Had Cosmic Marjorie on the anniversary of her death directed my moments. Well, Cosmic Marjorie came back. This past May, I was packing for a trip to Florida. She practically shouted at me. Don't wait to put it in your damn will. So I took the YF edition of the yearling with Marge's signature to the University of Florida and handed it, and handed it over. It belongs there, not in my messy study, 1,500 miles from Cross Creek. It belongs there because I swear, Marjorie told me it did. 